Hi, in this video, I'll go over how to get the formula for expected frequencies in a chi-square test for a contingency table. That is the test for independence or homogeneity. And I'll also touch on the degrees of freedom. Now, let's recall a uh, fundamental concept in hypothesis testing, and that is in doing hypothesis tests, we start out assuming that H0 is true. We start out assuming that the null hypothesis is true. And then we compute the test statistic and p-value from there. In fact, what the p-value is defined as is the probability of randomly getting a sample as extreme as ours, assuming that H0 is true. So that assumption is fundamental to hypothesis testing. So in a chi-square test of independence homogeneity, you're looking at a two-way table, and you're looking at the interaction between two variables, one variable along the columns and the second variable along the rows. And each cell or each box in the table contains a number of people, animals, or things that fit these particular values of the two variables. So in other words, it's a table of frequencies. So the expected frequency simply means the frequency that you would expect in each of these boxes. This box, each of these boxes, what would the frequency be if H0 were true? So the expectation is based on what if H0 were true. Right, so let's take an example. Researchers studied diabetes in Native Americans in New Mexico. This summary table shows the cost classification at educational level versus diabetic status. So this is a table of the actual number of people that match particular description of people having some college and being diabetic, 20 of them. Okay, these are the actual number of people that the researchers found in the field. These are the frequencies that the researcher actually observed. So we call them the observed frequencies. In the chi-square test of independence, we're testing whether or not these two variables, educational level and diabetic status, are independent. The no hypothesis is that they're independent, and the alternative hypothesis is that they're not independent. So before computing the expected frequencies, Let's first see what the observed frequencies are not. And here's the insight. The no hypothesis is that the two variables are independent. If the two variables were independent, then that means the educational level don't affect whether or not someone is diabetic. Well, overall, there are 95 diabetic people out of 1,273. So we're looking at 95 out of 1273, which is about 0.075, is the proportion of people who are diabetic. Well, if educational level were independent of being diabetic, then all of these other proportions should also be 0.075. What are they? Let's take a look. For people with less than a high school education, the actual proportion is 33 out of 251, and that is approximately 0.131. For high school grads, it's 25 out of 414, which is approximately 0.060. And same thing with people with some college and people who are college graduates. For some college, it's 20 out of 413. And for people who are college graduates, it's 17 out of 195 or 0.087. None of them are the same as the overall proportion. So in this sample, the observed frequencies do not indicate independence, at least not exactly independent. 
And the point of hypothesis testing is to test to see whether or not this kind of sample could have been obtained by chance. So we would want to compare these observed frequencies with the expected frequencies, meaning the frequencies that we would have gotten if educational level and status of being diabetic were truly independent. Every educational level would have the same proportion of diabetic as the overall. So let's clear the board and keep just the total and compute the proportions. The overall proportion of diabetic is 95 out of 1273, and that is about 0.075. Well, if all educational level had the same, then that means we should be able to apply this proportion to each educational level. So if I were to apply this proportion to the group of college graduates, the frequency of college grads with diabetes should be 95 over 1273 applied to 195, meaning multiplied by 195. And since 195 is 195 over 1, I can write this fraction as 95 times 195 over 1273. And I can do the same thing for high school graduates. I will take 95 over 1273 and apply that to 414, meaning I've multiplied by 414. And the same thing with people with less than high school, 95 over 1273 times 251. And for that matter, I should be able to do this for the people who are not diabetic as well. The proportion of being not diabetic is 1178 divide by 1273. And I should be able to take this overall proportion of people not diabetic and apply it to each category. So for the first category, for example, the number of people who don't have diabetics should be 1178 over 1273 times 251. So the proportion times the total equals the number. And doing the same thing, I should be able to fill out the entire table. And a pattern emerges. All the denominators are the same, and they're all this number here, the grand total in the lower right corner. And the numerator? The numerator are all a part of the two numbers. And let's see what those two numbers are. The first number, let's take the box that says some college and diabetic. Then the first number is the 95 that comes from here. And the second number is 413, which comes from there. And if you look at all the other boxes, you see that the same pattern obtains in each box, that the numerator consists of the total for that row times the total for that column. So it looks like the formula should be row total times the column total divided by the grand total, which is the total number of people that the researcher found. So the grand total is actually the sample size. Let's prove that the formula should be row total times column total divided by grand total. Let's take some big table and let's look for the expected frequency in this box. We don't know what the frequency there should be, so we just call it x. If the null hypothesis were true, the proportion of this box to its total should be the same as the overall total for that category divided by the grand total. So in other words, x divided by column total should be equal to row total divided by the grand total. And we solve for x, we multiply both sides by column total, and we end up with x equals row total times column total divided by grand total. So there we have it. Now let's talk about degrees of freedom. Let's clear the whole thing again. The way I think about it is this, in the contingency table, all the row totals must add up to the grand total. 
all the rows are free to be whatever they want, except for one, right? The last one has to be a specific number so that it adds up to the grand total, which is the sample size. So as far as the rows are concerned, all the rows except one are free. So the degrees of freedom for all the rows is R minus one, where R is the number of rows. We also have to worry about the columns. The columns must also add up to the grand total. And so all the columns are free except for one. So as far as the columns are concerned, the degrees of freedom is C minus one, where C is number of columns. Well, and then when we cross these two together in a two-way table, we have R minus one times C minus one. So that's the overall degrees of freedom for the whole table. In summary, in a contingency table problem, the expected frequency in each cell is equal to row total times column total divided by grand total. And the degrees of freedom is equal to R minus one times C minus one, where R is the number of rows and C is the number of columns. Now, one last thing. When you calculate the expected frequencies, most often you will get a decimal. In this box, for example, you take the row total times column total divided by grand total, you get 95 times 251, which is equal to 23,845 divided by 1273. And chances are you will have some decimal and this will be 18.7313, etc. When filling the table with expected frequencies, you keep decimals. So even though this is supposed to be a head count of number of people, these expected frequencies are there for purposes of calculation. So for this box, I will put something like 18.731. You do not round to the nearest whole number. This is a little bit similar to when people say things like the, the average family has 2.1 kids. There's no such thing as 2.1 kids, but it's an average number. In a way, this is sort of like an average number. So when calculating expected frequencies, keep the decimals. All right, hope that helps. Thanks for watching. Bye.